Some bands are around for a good time and not a long time. Here's 10 punk bands with only one album. Let's go. Negative Approach. Starting this list off strong with one of the most underrated hardcore punk bands. This band from Detroit, Michigan had one purpose, and one purpose only, and that's to fuck your shit right up. They may be the most vicious and visceral band in all of hardcore punk, at least of its early era. I mean, just listen to John Brandon's voice. It's outright terrifying. He sounds like he's expelling his organs through his mouth when he sings, and it's absolutely glorious. The instrumentation is intense yet precise enough as to not fall apart before the first verse. You can tell while listening to their album, Tied Down, that if they had continued to release more material, they would have most definitely have gone the route of such bands as DRI or Suicidal, and gone into the emerging crossover thrash genre at some point. Their self-titled debut EP also has many of the same defining elements of this band, mainly John's vocals, though less defined. And it feels more in a traditional punk vein than tied down, with a heavier emphasis on gang vocals and traditional hooks. But it also has some insanely short songs, like the 10 second long opus, Pressure. I mean, it's hardcore punk, what else were you expecting? The band's lineup was so volatile that they almost didn't even record tied down before officially splitting up in 1984. They reunited in 2006 and have been consistently playing shows ever since, even though Brannon is the only original member presence. But it's cool that there's still a version of this band still around. Minor Threats. You can't talk too long about punk or especially hardcore without bringing up Minor Threats at some points. And that's for damn good reason. They embody hardcore. Not just for their music, but they also helped establish the DIY aesthetic that has grown to define punk rock. They also inspired the straight edge movement, which much like the DIY aesthetic, is still prevalent today. And the thing with straight edge hardcore bands is they're not necessarily better than their non-straight edge counterparts, but they have this piss and vinegar that other bands don't have. They're just angrier, which in hardcore is a huge plus. Minor Threat's entire discography, including their EPs, can be digested in less than 50 minutes, which I honestly wouldn't recommend doing because after listening to about an album's length of material, I'm just out of breath. Ian Mackay's voice is a tidal wave of contempt and he's the embodiment of the adolescent fury that existed in America in the early 80s. Their album Out of Step represents them to a T because they were not only out of step with the world, but even within the punk community, they were outcasts. I mean, the punk scene was synonymous with self-destruction and decay, but Minor Threat were on a mission to prove that you didn't need to be a junkie and die before you're 21. You could aspire to do great things and live your life to the fullest. Just listen to their song, appropriately titled, Straight Edge. They were one of the first prominent punk bands to truly stand for something bigger than themselves. And they weren't about wallowing in their own excess and degeneracy, and that's a beautiful thing. And their story didn't really end there as Makai went on to form Fugazi with the frontman of another band we'll see on this list, and bassist and guitarist Brian Baker went on to form Dag Nasty and join Bad Religion. Boxcar Racer. <laughs> Now we have the side project of Tom DeLonge from Blink-180. Okay, put away your preconceived notions for a second because Boxcar Racer is arguably the best thing to come out of anyone from the Blink camp. But then again, I'm self-aware enough to know that isn't saying a whole lot. After the cheese-tastic, take off your pants and jacket, Tom DeLonge was depressed and neurotic because of his chronic back pain and the painkillers he was on, and he wanted to take the band further than songs about your first date and pizza parties. And he thought if he could experiment with new ideas in between albums, then it'll make the next Blink record even better. And he was right. But the eponymous Boxcar Racer album is still formidable in its own right. Tom is heavily inspired by post-hardcore bands, especially Fugazi, and while there's still a lot of pop punk to be found, it's angrier and meaner. Sure, no one's gonna confuse it for brand new, but for the guy who wrote all the small things, it's impressive how far he took his songwriting in such a short span of time. And it's not like he lost his signature sense of humor, either. I got no dick. 
Both of Tom's bandmates in Blink appeared on the record. Travis Barker played drums on the whole thing, which is a pleasure to hear because that man is just so good at what he does, pushing Tom's songs to newer and newer heights, and his parts are so intricate and fun to listen to. And Mark Hoppus contributed vocals to the track Elevator as a sort of peace offering, after Mark was justifiably upset at Tom for leaving him in the dust to record this album. But yeah, if you wanted a more ferocious version of Blink-182, then give this record a shot. And hey, even if you hate everything Blink stands for, you can at least thank this record for breaking them up. But it also led to them recording this, so be careful what you wish for, I guess. Hey guys, uh, I'm an idiot. I originally put a band on this list who actually has more than one album. I'll have some text on screen kind of explaining the nitty gritty of the situation. So I added a new band in their place. Please excuse my autism, that's all I can say. Extremist. From one side project of a hated pop punk band to another, but this time there's at least a tiny bit of credibility. This is the side project of Davey Havoc and Jade Puget from AFI, and those in the know are aware that before records like Sing the Sorrow and December Underground came out, A Fire Inside were a big name within the 90s California hardcore scene. If you've never heard this band's early catalog, everything up to and including The Art of Drowning in 2000 is very much worth your time. But Extremist is a different beast entirely. This band isn't trying to recreate the 90s hardcore sound. Their one self-titled record has many modern hardcore sensibilities. It has heavier production, more metallic riffing, and vocals that border on extreme metal. I'm surprised that Davey can do vocals like this. In his early career, he screamed plenty, but his voice was very high-pitched. I always thought of him as the King Diamond of hardcore, or the inverse Glenn Danzig. But Extremist showcases Davey Havoc unleashing a voice I have never heard him use before or since. This is a straight edge record, and you can tell. It has that piss and vinegar that the best straight edge bands have. And not only is Davey going apeshit, but instrumentally it's cacophonic assault of dissonance post-punk inspired riffs with some real atmosphere. Which is something you don't see very often in hardcore, at least the hardcore I listen to. You can still kind of tell who it was made by, despite its differences compared to anything AFI have done since they're on Nitro Records. The other members also do great since Davey and Jade recruited members of Seosin and Stick to Your Guns. It's a real shame this band was so short-lived. They only ever released this one album in 2014, and they only ever played two shows before all the members went back to their main bands. Like, come on, guys. Was recording the Blood album really more important than this? Operation Ivy. This is a band you can blame for all the insufferable ska-punk bands to come since. They aren't a ska-punk what the Violent Femmes are to folk-punk. But don't let the lameness of their genre's later era deter you from checking out Op Ivy's outputs. Their at the time unique mix of hardcore and ska made them such a vital part of the California Gilman punk scene. A huge influence of the pop punk bands who would blow up in the 90s. Mainly Green Day who still cover their song Knowledge all these years later live. Even though their ska elements are quite lighthearted sounding, especially on a song like Bad Town. No. No Their songs that are rooted in more aggressive hardcore with less ska aren't any less vicious, thanks to Jesse Michael's unforgettable growl in songs like Unity or Bombshell. And Tim Armstrong, or as he was known back then, Lint, had these wispy backing vocals that really complemented Jesse's in a really cool way. This band also has one of the best rhythm sections in all of punk. Bassist Matt McCall and drummer Dave Mello are just as important as Jesse and Tim if you ask me. These songs are so bouncy and rhythmic thanks to them. Also this band was incredibly political. Which was the style at the time? With songs attacking the Nazi skinheads infesting the scene at the time, the supposed American dream, and several other things. It's no surprise Jesse Michaels went on to become an author given how good these lyrics are. And they were incredibly strict to their convictions. When they started selling a lot of tickets to shows, they were offered a major label deal from EMI, but they instead decided to break up at what was supposed to be the record release party for their solitary album, Energy. They could have easily just taken Green Day's place as a mainstream faces of 90s punk rock, but maybe it's for the best they got out of Dodge when they did. The Heartbreakers. Baby, 
When legendary guitarist Johnny Thunders left the New York Dolls due to a cavalcade of problems the band was going through, drummer Jerry Nolan joined him and they formed the Heartbreakers, originally with Richard Hell, but he wasn't to last, instead getting Billy Rath on bass and Walter Lure helping out Johnny on guitar and vocals. Despite being a huge draw in New York City, they couldn't ink a deal before going to England where they signed with Track Records. They released LAMF in 1977, the title being an abbreviation for the phrase like a motherfucker. According to many who saw them live, the album doesn't really do the band justice, but I still love it. Unlike every other first wave punk band, the Heartbreakers was made up of players who had a lot of experience so they could outplay damn near every band they shared a stage with. Johnny Thunders is honestly cool incarnate and his riffs, licks, and vocals back up that statement. Thunders never considered anything he did to be punk. It was all rock and roll to him, and that was the ethos. They weren't trying to do anything new. You can make the argument that the Heartbreakers were like the New York Dolls 2.0, maybe with just a bit more aggression since Walter and Johnny sang songs nowhere near as flamboyantly as David Johansson. Their main attribute was the fact that they were constantly wasted. I'm honestly surprised it took until the 90s for a member of this band to start dropping off. The songs are dripping with a kind of upbeat nihilism with songs like Born to Lose or All by Myself, to songs about the heroin that was consuming the band with songs like One Track Mind or Chinese Rocks written by Richard Howell and Dee Ramone, and even fantastic ballads like I Love You and It's Not Enough. This band was just the coolest. What else can I say? They also beat Tom Petty to name by about a year and I found that kind of funny. Gorilla Biscuits. Now this is a band with not too much of a history or reputation like every other band on this list. They're just good. And I mean really good. You can easily make a case that their album, Start Today, is the greatest hardcore punk record ever. At the very least top 5. There's a sense of scale here. In the opening track there's trumpets almost introducing the band like royalty. Yes, trumpets on a hardcore record. There's also a harmonica on the title track, a merry whistle on the song Competition, as well as some reverb and Day I Say It's Atmosphere on that track, as well as a few others. This band gave no fucks. If it sounded good, they'll do it. You can tell by the guitar work from Alex Brown and Walter Schreifels, the latter being the band's songwriter. It's no surprise he ended up forming Quicksand later on. There's a lot of great riffs here, featuring a lot of palm mute chugging and guitar arrangements with a lot of depth. They're one of very few hardcore punk bands to really justify having more than one guitar player. Anthony Civarelli was a great vehicle for Walter's songs, he had a mean bark as any good hardcore singer does, but he could also really sing these tracks and put a lot of emotion behind the words, as if he wrote them himself. Not to mention this is maybe the best produced hardcore punk album I've ever heard, even most of the best records from this era are generally very rough around the edges. And I like him that way, don't get me wrong, but Start Today is a laser precise 24 minutes. And you gotta give them credit for never leaving a single instrument lost in the mix. Even the harmonica, whistles, and reverb, which can easily destroy a mix if you're not careful. There's not much else to say, this is just a masterfully crafted album. And their debut EP ain't bad either. The Sex Pistols. I'm sure you all saw this one coming, but I can't just not talk about the Sex Pistols here. They were a band who helped define punk rock in the mainstream more than maybe any other band. And a lot of it was the fashion and things that you can credit Malcolm McLaren for, but just as much if not more was John and Steve's wearing on the Grundy program, Sid Vicious hitting people over the head with his bass, and the songs. Nothing else would matter if it wasn't for the songs. You have Steve Jones who was very new to the instruments carrying a level of rebellion in his riffs, John Lydon's lyrics were as cutting and sharp as his voice was, but it worked. If they had a singer like Joe Strummer or Pete Shelley, it wouldn't work as well. His voice was that of every young person in England without a hope in the world. There's so much anger there because he was speaking for more than just himself. No future, no future. 
Also, we can't forget about the members of this band who actually knew how to play their instruments. Paul Cook was more than a capable drummer, providing the songs with a solid foundation for Steve and John to do what they do best, and Glenn Matlock may have been kicked out of the band before he could play more than one song on their only album, Never Mind the Bollocks. Did I say it right this time? But his contributions to the songwriting of the album were very important. He was heavily inspired by the Beatles and even ABBA. That's why so many of the songs off this album led with the hook or a catchy riff. It's pure pop songwriting, and it's fantastic. That's why so many songs off this record are still used in commercials and TV shows to this very day. And it's why Johnny Rotten is now my favorite Disney princess. Rites of Spring. This band is widely known by every music nerd worth their salt as the first ever emo band. And while they're indisputably important to that genre's formation, I think it's a bit of a stretch to call them emo outright. It's melodic hardcore, not too dissimilar from bands like Bad Religion, Descendants, or Dag Nasty. The main difference is the fact that Rites of Spring had introspective and emotional lyrics, but lyrics don't really dictate genre. The band themselves hated the label being thrown at them with Guy Picciotto saying years later, I've never recognized emo as a genre of music. The reason I think it's so stupid is that, like, the Bad Brains weren't emotional? Were they robots or something? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Though there's a few songs that have post-punk vibes and atmosphere, which combined with Picciotto's reflective words and paint vocals, you can see where later bands took what Rites of Spring was doing and ran with it. The eponymous Right to Spring album is a visceral and heated record. It's a sound of young men who are suffering, taking it out on their instruments. Their most popular song, For Want Of, is a desperate track of longing for what you've lost, with some of the greatest lyrics ever in punk rock. Let me say, if this is the first emo record, then all emo lyrics since have been going downhill since 1985, I'll say that much. The final track, End On End, is a 7.5 minute long song with rises and falls throughout its track length simultaneously containing the band at their most quiet and minimal to the next second showing them at their loudest and angriest. Long story short, if you need a band to cry and mosh to, then these guys have you covered. Also, Guy Picciotto went on to perform Fugazi with Ian McKay. I added this in post, I've got to put it in the script, I'm very sorry. The Germs. Now this list is in no real order, but the Germs are probably my favorite band on this list. I remember first hearing about them in that Foo Fighters documentary many years ago, and hearing Lexicon Devil for the first time, it really left an impression on me. But I didn't check them out till high school, cause fuck I couldn't have been any older than 11 at the time. In fact, I think they were the first hardcore punk band I ever really fell in love with. I liked some Black Flag songs prior, but the Germs were not only more intense, but they had a great sense for melody. Their album, G.I., produced by Joan Jett, has so many hooks all over the place that you'll be humming days later. Darby Crash was a genius who, through a mix of philosophy and plain edginess, wrote the wordiest lyrics I've maybe ever seen in a punk record. It's kind of a shame you can't tell what he's saying most of the time because he's screaming through that drawl that he's so famous for the whole time. But I also love his voice, so I can live with it. Don Bull's drums are cutthroat and give these songs a catchy tempo. Pat Samir's guitars are a thrashing mass. And listening to the record, you just wonder what the hell he's doing in the Foo Fighters nowadays, other than collecting a paycheck. Probably hit lots of girls in the face. I don't like girls very much. Lorna Doom's bass is really prominent in the mix, which I'm happy about because she was really underrated. She was always in the pocket and complimented both Don and Pat perfectly. She had such a round but perky tone that gave the riff such a strength. I mean, just listen to Manimal. Rest in peace, Lorna. We miss you. The band's history was wild, too. A pre go go's Belinda Carlisle was a founding member and can even be heard on their live album, Germicide. The reason why I'm not in the group anymore because they're too dirty for me and they're sluts. To them getting blacklisted in LA, to Darby's Adam Ants period, to his unfortunate suicide in 1980. Rest in peace to you too, dude. We also miss you. Thanks for watching to the end. What was your favorite out of the bands mentioned? Did I miss any? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and all that good stuff so the YouTube algorithm won't come to my house and kill me. But anyways, 
Take it easy, party people. It's the time up now.